in a world in which we have filled with all kind of negative, tragic things happening in the world, CNN has decided to do a good thing. They're picking this year 10 outstanding heroes who are changing the direction of the world in a positive way. Kim Carter is going to be with us. Stay tuned. <music> lady who's standing out not just here in San Bernardino, California, but standing out in the world as a sign of hope that we can do something, especially about women, women who are struggling, who are oh, not knowing where they're going to go the next day. There's a wonderful lady by the name of Kim Carter. God bless you, Kim. Thank you very much for coming and being with us today. Thanks for having me. I'm so it's excited. It's an honor to have you here with no, us the and blessing sharing, is mine. sharing this. To be able to know that you're a woman who has gone through an awful lot in your life, and, and despite what seems like an overwhelming reality, you've turned it around and now you're reaching out and you're helping a lot of people. Can you give us a little bit about who you are and where you've come from, and then we can understand a little bit more of the enormity of what you've done to change things. Um, I was born beautiful like most children, but somewhere along the ages of five to six to seven, I was being molested on a regular basis. Mm. That wound inside of me turned to a cancerous sore, and from being in an environment with drug addiction and alcohol and drinking, uh, that was how I eased the pain of the abuse that I had suffered, mm. you know, and as it progressed and it was stuffed, it fermented, and as it fermented, it would shoot out various uh, behaviors, and those behaviors eventually uh, started me to go in and out of jails. And this is where we're talking about the, the, the drinking, the drugs, and even the prostitution. Exactly. That's, that's how you deal with the pain. That was the behaviors from the sore. Mm -hmm. So instead of um, being addressed with my root cause, I was addressed with my symptoms. And so society, rightfully so, uh, decided to keep me incarcerated because I had the behaviors that was um, what we call criminal. Your, ma your, your mentality was what probably overcome with a lot of hopelessness and a lot of uh, very, very even depression. W w does that make sense? Depression was regular. Mm. The hopelessness, I didn't even know that I could get a life. I never knew that. I saw you had a life. I saw other people had a life, but I didn't know that I could get one. Because of the track record and the path I had been on for so long, I didn't even know that there was a way out. You were probably filled with an awful lot of the word guilt and even shame because of, um, oh, maybe I was the one that was the real source of the problem. Isn't that the danger of what happens sometimes when you're abused? It turns back and you feel that you're the one that is really at fault. Do, am I, am well, I right in that? Well, early on I did think that I was a reason for some of my uh, mother's uh, fair relationships, but today you know, I know, I know otherwise, right? Today I know that at six years old I ain't the cause of nothing. Yeah, precisely. I'm not the cause of nothing. And that's why um, healing is so important to get past uh, those misconceptions that we put on ourselves. It's um, one thing for society to condemn you, but when you condemn yourself, it's another. Yeah. And that self-loathing and degradation, it goes with you for a long time. And that's where I was trapped. So I didn't care about me, so I couldn't care about you. I couldn't be the mother to my daughter that I needed to be and wanted to be because I had this sense of hopelessness and degradation that I couldn't let go of until I found him. Tell me about him, and, and how did you find him? We're talking about the Lord Jesus. We're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, and I had been um, in my regular place called prison, which that's where I go all the time, and um, one of the officers had money in her budget to start a program. She wanted only 100 people to be a part of this program. It was called Forever Free. And she said, I want 100 of the worst women, the women who come in here all the time, the women who, you know, can't stay out. I was picked as number 87. 
So I got into that drug program and I actually sat there and started hearing some information that I had never heard before. I never knew that um, because I had those molestations and those uh, abuses that I thought I had got past it. I didn't know that it festered inside. Mm -hmm. I needed therapeutic counseling to help dig that out. And I remember the lady coming to me one day and I was still my prison demeanor, you know, don't touch me, like don't talk to me. Still had my guards up and she came over to me and she rubbed me ever so gently. And she said, you know, baby, we're not gonna be able to help you. I was like, what do you mean you can't help me? She goes, cause you've been, you've been hurt so bad. Mm. You've been abused so hard that your walls are so thick and we can't penetrate to get in there. And she was just like, well, what happened? Mm. What happened to you? And I remember that tear rolling down as I started thinking about what happened. Was it when I was raped? Was it when I was shot at? Was it when I had a gun put to my head and jumped out of a window? Was it when I was in the trunk of a car? Like what had happened? But I realized so much had happened, I couldn't put my finger on it. And when I had that one tear, cause I had been quit crying, I began to open up a little and they told me, you're not ready to leave because you need a lot of therapy. So what we're gonna offer you is an opportunity when you get out of prison to leave straight from here and go straight to a drug program. Don't, don't go nowhere else, go straight mm -hmm. to the program. And I went to that program, I left prison. I didn't go back into that environment. I didn't go back into that cycle of abuse. I didn't and go that's back. That's one of the biggest problems of getting out of jail you don't know where to go, and so you go back to where you were, and as you said, it's a cycle that returns you right back to where you were because you, you have the support of the wrong people. You don't have the support, period. You yeah. have the people that's helping you to do what you've always done. Yeah. Because, see, you play a role in that, especially in dysfunctional families. If you're part of a dysfunctional unit and say your role is to go out and, you know, and steal and bring in food, then when you come out of prison, they're looking at you and saying, hey, we hungry. Here's, here's the breadwinner. Right, <laughs> go do what you do. And they'll put that pressure on you to go out there and do what you do. Wow. And that is a part of how the pieces of dysfunctional family fit together. And when you step out of that dysfunction and you begin to heal, you see the resentment of that family. You see the resentment because they don't really um, know how to accept you when you're changing. They don't know how to accept that you're not gonna be on drugs no more, you're not gonna be robbing, you're not gonna be stealing. And th the problem is, that they're threatened by, by the goodness that you, you exhibit. They're threatened by the freedom and the joy that you have that probably scares them to death. Because it reminds them that there's a light inside of them. They need to let it shine. And they're frightened to death of that. Marian, maybe, maybe the guilt and the, and the anger and whatnot are, are just overpowering in them. But now we want to talk about Jesus was able somehow to open a door what, in what seemed impossible let me tell you this, and I know you know the story. The woman with the issue of blood. Yes. The Bible don't tell us how she got the issue, but she had the issue, yes. and she was ostracized from the community. She was put out on the, on the outskirts. Society didn't want to be bothered with her no more because she had this issue. You couldn't touch her. You couldn't her touch her. Her family didn't want to be bothered with her no more. But she heard the news. She heard that there was one going to come to town, and that one, she's going to be able to get a healing. Now, she only had one shot at this, Father. She only had one shot to get in. And she lost all of her money on medicine, on, on everything, all, every, every, everything was gone. Nothing was helping because she was conflicted with this issue. And she knew that it was going to ever be a time for her to get her healing. She needed to go into town and face up to all the people who was going to be mocking her. Mm -hmm. What are you doing here? Why are you here? Why are you back? We don't want you here. And you know, and Jesus, he had his gatekeepers. He had the people that surrounded him. And so she couldn't just walk up to him. She had to crawl her way to get in, right? This is how you know God is so good. She crawled her way to get in and she couldn't even get close enough to touch him, but she can just get down that ground and she touched the hem of his garment just to him, right? Jesus didn't come to save her. She went to Jesus and got her savings. She trusted him in his, of his garden. Yeah. And he turned around and said, who was that that drew from me? Who was that that came and got their healing? So I tell all my girls, don't wait on the healing. Go get it. Because she, she went and she got her healing. And she trusted him in her garden. And the Bible says that she was healed. When? Immediately. She was healed immediately. So once God healed you immediately, 
Is, can society keep reminding you about that you had an issue of blood? Do you want to walk around healed? And people keep saying, well, you know, you were the one with the issue. But see, but my God healed me immediately. So I walk in the knowingness of knowing that my God has healed me immediately. So I don't let society remind me about the prison. I don't let them remind me about when I was a prostitute. I don't let them keep remembering the last chapter of my life because it's a new chapter. And God has healed me. I've been sober and clean 22 years, mm -hmm. free from addiction and incarceration. Because see, I too, like the one with the issue of blood, was able to touch to him. So that's how I know that God is real. That's how I know he's real in my life. And the beautiful thing is that you're not just keeping that to yourself. You've decided to start an organization that's going to allow that change that happens to you to bring a change into the lives of many people. We're going to come back and, and, and we've got a little bit of a break. But I want to hear this victory story, this victory that is affecting many, many women on the road, on the streets, and giving up all hope. And with this lovely lady and what she's been able to do through the Lord is bring about changes. Stay tuned. One of the most charming aspects of Jesus was that not only did he heal people, not only did he walk on water, but Matthew and Mark say that whenever he was talking to a large group of people, maybe thousands of people, he only told stories. I love that because thinking of Jesus as a master storyteller is so intriguing. And I've written a book about the parables of Jesus. The book is called 15 Faces of God. I go through 15 parables, uh, the exciting ones, and then I show how Jesus is saying in this magnificent love that he has for his Father, this is who my Father is. So as you listen, you're going to hear various, various faces of God searching humble, listening, celebrating, loving, forgiving, proud, and even optimistic. I want you to have this book. We're going to be giving you a special offer. For $10, you're going to be able to have this book. This will be a great way for you to help our television ministry and also find a wonderful way of understanding how Jesus uses these magnificent stories as opening the door for us to know who God the Father is. So please, a $10 donation or $10 or more if you can to allow yourself to be enriched and to also bless this ministry, this television ministry, which is continually needing your prayers but also needing your financial support. Please, make sure you get this book. Kim, you went through an awful lot in your life, and yet in, rather than just kind of sit in the corner and say, oh dear, well, I'm healed by Jesus and I feel good in myself, you've decided to reach out to others. And you have a, an organization Time for change. Tell us how this got started. You, how long were you in jail? Well, I've been in jail on and off for over 12 years. 12 so years. I've done many stints in jails and prisons. But when 2002, I had been working here in the community. I had a job, I had my home, every three night with my daughter, and I was living what I would call a good life. And the Lord kept waking me up in the middle of the night and he was like, I need you to help women who was entrapped and enslaved the same way that you are. I'm like entrapped and enslaved the same way that I am. I'll go back to sleep on that. <laughs> I you want to push that away. Up, but he told me to leave my job, my financial security, and start Time for Change Foundation. And I became heavily convicted in the middle of the wee hours of the morning. I asked my husband at the time, uh, I told him what the Lord was telling me to do, and he said, go for it. Mm. And so I was able to start Time for Change Foundation. I left my job without knowing my, where my next check would come from. And um, 
we got our first home. So, now, okay, God talks to you and says, okay, I want you to do something great. How in heaven's name do you take the first step? Well, you, you, you say that you're going to do it, but then how do you bring that into a reality? Because he asked me, what did I need, what, what did I need when, I get it, when I got out? Ah. I needed a place to change at. Ah. See, I needed somebody to offer me something then, you know, uh, some squalor or some, you know, poverty-stricken residents with rodents running around and telling me that I should be grateful for getting in there because <laughs> after all, I did sleep on the streets. I did sleep in abandoned houses. And this is mo so much better. Right. And so I needed something different than that because when you're in the delusion of drugs and alcohol, then that's your reality. But when you're saved and you're clean and sober, you can't live in those conditions. So I wanted to create Time for Change for that reason, to give women a place to change at. So we started with the first home in very nice neighborhoods. We're, we're located on the north end of San Bernardino. My kids and the shelters go to very good schools. We have a very good library. We have very good grocery stores. And my women see very healthy atmospheres. Oh, I gotcha. Environment so it, is important. Building, getting a building, inviting the women to come. How do you get them to come? Because I could imagine, well, I would imagine the majority of people are saying, uh-uh, this isn't for me. The streets are where I belong. How do you get them to be convinced that this new life is really something that they do deserve? See, something about the light. When people are in the dark, see the light, because they see it in you. They see it in me where I've overcome those obstacles. Uh, okay. Everywhere that they've been, I've been. Okay. I've helped over 850 women over the past 12 years. And so the women who have recovered and are doing well, people see them. Hey, how'd you get clean and sober? I went to Time for Change. You should go to Time for Change. So it kind of like spreads by word of mouth when people see the miraculous change, the transformational work that we're doing here in the community. What's the biggest obstacle that you face when a woman comes comes to you and says, um, okay, here I am. How do, how, do you, how do you overcome whatever is most difficult in, in them? So because um, we have experience of incarceration, we kind of have no nonsense, right? We have zero tolerance for any more street games. And they, <laughs> <laughs> and they catch on to that really, really quickly. And we let them know, you came here to do what? They say change. So not to change us, but for you to change, right? And what I also did was um, I found out that we need to offer women there's best practices available. There's evidence-based treatment available for mental health issues, for substance abuse. And so why mm -hmm. aren't we giving women who need the most, the best that there is. So what we do, we pride ourselves in delivering cutting edge, cutting edge evidence-based programs and services. So that means that I'm giving you the best science has to offer. I'm not giving you a 10-day dose when you need a 30-day dose. I'm giving you the full dose so that you can have a full recovery. And once you recover, you can become self-sufficient for you and your children. See, we take pride in our children at our program. We, they have their own case management. They have their own um, educational and development plan. Mm -hmm. We want to ensure that they get back on track because oftentimes they've been homeless with their parents or living in abandoned facilities, missing meals, missing school, so we get them back on track. So the only obstacle that we face would be the obstacle within the woman and her desire to change because we only work with the willing. We can't make a woman change. Yeah, yeah. Jails didn't make them change. But what I know is like for myself and so many others, we wanted to change. We just need the place to change at. I found in my own life that th this challenge of change, whether it's a, a sinful habit that you can get to even, even if not going to jail, or moving away from God's will in my life, one of the most important, just simple ingredients is this simple little phrase, accepting the fact that God loves you. I know that sounds rather trite and very simple, but in many ways, I think that's the whole foundation of religion, of all things. I think the bottom question that I want to ask you is, um, you've done something very, very courageous and very beautiful. What can we do as we sit in our comfortable homes and maybe o overly concerned about some of our own personal problems? What are some of the things that we can do to be able to maybe support you but also support a movement that moves away from ignoring the people on the side of the street. I would say, don't be invisible. 
participate in the city council meetings. You know, of course, uh, donations is always good to support mm -hmm. our organization because we can help support more women. You know, you can go to our website. It's www.timeforchangefoundation.org.org. Call us on our office numbers, 909-886-2994, and help us to help them because we know that an extension of God's love is reaching your hand out. Not teaching women how to have a, how to accept a handout, but for you to reach your hand out to help somebody else along. See, we pride ourselves in, we don't disempower the women by telling them or making them think, I'm gonna feed you for the day. We empower them to show them how you can feed yourself and feed another. The difference between the, the fish and the fishing pole. Uh, am I gonna give you a fish or am I gonna give you a pole to be able to fish so that you can be able to go on further? and teach someone else how to fish. Because see, we ah. can only keep what we have <laughs> by giving it away. I'm yes. a 12 step uh, in AACA program. And there's a lot of tenets that we have to follow, right? We have to make amends. We have to be of service. We have to be of service. I have to make sure that at all times, my life is able to be used by God because what would happen if I was left with me all by myself again? Tell, tell I, I don't understand what you mean. Uh, you you have to be a life of service. Explain that a little bit more. So when you're in recovery from drugs and alcohol, yes. I have 22 years clean and sober today. Yes. Every day starts a new day. Every day I have a daily reprieve. Every day I have to maintain my spiritual maintenance and my contact with my God. And the tension is still there to be able to go back. It's not a tension. The fact of it is it's an illness. Yeah, okay. And so it's a spiritual malady. And so if I don't stay connected with God and his will in my life, I'll be left with my will. It's like ego. Ego for us is edging God out. I can't afford to be so heavenly bound. I'm no earthly good. I need to make sure that the purpose for my life that he saved me for, that I'm doing it so I don't get a day off from that. Because mm -hmm. again, this thing right here was the, is the same brain that I had 25 years ago that had had all them other bright ideas that didn't work out so well. It wasn't until I gave my heart and my heart being my mind over to Christ that I was able to be of purpose. Can you imagine a person who's gone through the devastation that I've gone through? I'm sitting here today, I can walk, I can see, I don't have HIV AIDS, I can be of service, I can still create, I can still help save another life. That's a blessing, that's, that's a purposeful walk. And for me to still have that ability from where I come from, yeah. I, I have to be of service. I don't, I don't have a choice. It's, it's not a what if, it's I have to. Because I, I like this thing called life. And it's, I'm only here by the grace of a loving God. And he's chosen me. He's resurrected me from a walk in death. Zero in mind, zero in body, and zero in spirit. Can you imagine walking around here like that? Yeah. With no sense of purpose, no sense a of zombie. hope? A zombie. And he brought me back into my full senses. I well, love them. I love them. The beautiful thing that you're saying is that if you really want to heal yourself, you've got to serve other people. Simple? Very simple and but very, very on point. But yeah. Very powerful. Listen, we're going to come back. I, I've got some people that have called in and have written emails that want, to, want for us to pray for them. W would you? Oh, would you, definitely. Stay tuned. Would you, we want to pray not only for those that have written, but also for you. Please uh, stay tuned, listen to this message. We're gonna be right back. One of the most charming aspects of Jesus was that he only told stories. I love that because thinking of Jesus as a master storyteller is so intriguing. And I've written a book about the parables of Jesus the book is called 15 Faces of God. I go through 15 parables, uh, the exciting ones, and then I show how Jesus is saying in this magnificent love that he has for his Father, I want you to have this book. We're going to be giving you a special offer. For $10, you're going to be able to have this book. This will be a great way for you to help our television ministry, which is continually needing your prayers, but also needing your financial support. Please, make sure you get this book. I help 
out at Glen Helen here in San Bernardino and go in there, and as I'm talking with the ladies, inevitably it comes, they're deep concerned and asking for prayers for their family, for their children. Uh, how's your daughter doing, and, and how were you able to make a bridge in the midst of the separation that happens with being in jail for so long, and then being able to give her the, the open door and the love that she needs? So I'll tell you, there's one thing that breaks from separation from your child when you're in prison, that mother's bond. And depending on how long you've been separated is how severe that bond is broken. Yeah, yeah. And once it's fractured, you spend the rest of your life trying to heal it. Yeah. We ask God to help us heal those relationships. Yeah. Today, my daughter and I, we're the best of friends. Excellent. But that bond that was broken it took a long time yeah, yeah. to get that built back up. And that's why at Time for Change Foundation, we help women to keep their children, to stay together, to work yeah, together yeah. to become self-sufficient because we don't want to see another person have to endure what I had to endure gotcha. by not having a place to rehab with my daughter present with me. God bless you. Listen, we've got people that have, that have called in and they've written an email uh, all across the country and um, let's, let's pray for them. This is Irene from Rhode Island. Um, um, praying, praying that, that uh, her brother will come back to the Lord. Margaret from California, um, recovering from stum stomach cancer. Yes, Lord. And Georgia, uh, from Georgia, Ronald. Um, uh, Rosalinda has stage four cancer. Yolanda from Texas, her children, her son, needs rent, no more money, and there's a dr drug addiction, and the temptation to drugs is very strong. And you, you pulled out this one very much, and, and this, we don't know where this is from, but this was someone who sent an email, and they're, they're praying that this Ebola virus over in Africa can be overcome. And there, there is a cure, but we're asking that that can continue and the money can come in. Would you put your hands on here? Let's pray with you. Lord, come into these lives into these lives with your healing power. Turn around things that seem impossible with grace and blessing and peace and a great healing in marriages, a great healing in especially as we talk about women who find that they're really just lost in terms of home, support, and family. And I ask that you bless Kim too as she gets ready to become this American hero through CNN. Bless her deeply. And may Jesus love for you always. Make you smile.